Kei ngā e hui hua o ngā maunga whakahi, kei ngā wai whakatere tanifa, nau mai tahuti mai ki te hui. Ko mihi ngā rangi tēnei, e mihi atu nei kia koutou katoa. Welcome to the hui, Māori Current Affairs for Aotearoa. E taroa ki nei. Born into a gang. To him that, that was like a family. And battling addiction and depression. All I see now is just this traumatised, emotional boy just covering it up with drugs, coping through it with drugs. In a special report, we look at how gang life impacts the mental health of rangatahi. Many gang whānau face multiple prejudices, criminal histories will be part of that, racism will be part of that, poverty is part of that picture as well. Tahuti mai. For those born into a gang, many are exposed to a way of life which leads to psychological trauma and mental health challenges. They are a section of our society heavily impacted because of the antisocial lifestyle they live. And in Aotearoa, their mental health issues have largely been ignored, with no data to see how extensive the problem is. Reporter Rowani Pereira explores the difficulties gang rangatahi face in accessing mental health services through the tra tragic death of a young man and the people who loved him. This item is made with the support of the Mental Health Foundation. For some, gang life is a path they choose. But for rangatahi born into gangs, there's very little choice in the matter. That's all he knew, and that's all he wanted to be, was a mobster. And it's that exposure to drugs and violence at a young age that can result in the loss of precious lives. Like this mob tangi for 24-year-old Bonus Atkins, who took his own life. It was the hardest moment of my life. <laughs> Mental health challenges and suicide amongst gang Fano has been described as a hidden contagion. Gangs may well be some of the most vulnerable people in our community when it comes to mental health, uh, compromises and self-harm. Bonus Atkins was a young man in distress with nowhere to turn. Do you think the system let him down? Definitely. If it wasn't for my family, I'd be where he is. I'd be with him. <laughs> Jay Tare couldn't help but fall in love with patched mongrel mob member, Bonus Atkins. He had the biggest heart. I knew a different side of him from what everyone else knew. Because I just saw the emotional side of him. There was a sook, a sooky baba. The pair came from two very different worlds. We weren't brought up around drinking or even drugs, you know. Totally different upbringing to him. Jade hoped she could show bonus there was another way to live. You don't have that gangster around here. You don't need that. I'll, I love you how you are. But for Bonus, born into the mongrel mob, gang life was his whole world. To him, that, that was like a family. His heart was with them, you know. And with gangs comes drugs. Bonus was hooked on smoking pee since he was 14. That was like his band-aid for things that he had seen, you know, growing up. But he thought the pee was making it better. While in prison, Bonus had stints of sobriety, but struggled to beat his addiction on the outside. All I see now is just this traumatised, emotional boy just covering it up with drugs, coping through it with drugs. Struggling with her own meth addiction, Jade decided to end their relationship to get clean. But the pair remained close and Jade watched helplessly as Bonus sunk deeper into depression. He was like, oh, there's something going on in my head, babe. 
and, and I'm scared. And that's when he said, it was like, I just want to go to sleep. And I just don't want to wake up. In his final Facebook post before he took his life last year, Bonus, a father of two, wrote about the effect using meth had on his mental state. Every time I smoke it, I'm pushing you all away even further. That's the most dangerous drug in the world. It will eventually take over your mind, body and soul and drive you to suicide. Bonus is buried here at Taruheru Cemetery in Gisborne. He rests next to his older brother, who committed suicide in his prison cell in 2015. The loss of his brother hit Bonus hard, and Jade says he tried to get help. He knew that there were organisations out there, but he didn't know how to get there. Jade says despite an earlier suicide attempt, Bonus received no treatment during his time in jail, nor after his release back into the community. I'm, like, shocked. The whole time I was with him, the only thing he had to do was go to probation. There was no, like, oh, babe, I've got to go see this therapist or, you know, counsellor, I've got to go to this place that had something to do with mental health. Nothing. And we were together for, like, yeah, two years but none of that talk. Bonus's story is all too common amongst gang Fano who live on the edges of society. But it can be a particular issue for Fano gang or otherwise that don't have access to adequate health care, mental health resources, adequate social support. Dr. Armin Tamatea is a clinical psychologist and a senior lecturer at Waikato University. He's done extensive research into gang communities in Aotearoa. Unresolved trauma or difficulties regulating emotions as a consequence of a history of trauma, for example. One way to cope with that is through uses of substances, uh, which can affect how we feel about things and how we think about things. It can help suppress negative feelings and um, introduce positive experiences. The issues, of course, is when we move into the space of addiction, when we can't do without that. Often the mental health of gang-affiliated rangatahi will go undiagnosed and untreated. Many gang whānau face multiple prejudices. Criminal histories will be part of that. Uh, racism will be part of that. But also poverty is part of that picture as well. And all of these are, are stressful situations to deal with. And, and when they all co-occur in the same whānau and the same people, those are very difficult circumstances to have to contend with day in, day out. It's only since his death that Jade has realised just how desperate Bonus's situation was. All these stories had told me, and they didn't, like, link up till after he had died, you know? And I'm like, you really did have something going on, you know? You are fighting some, like, deep shit in your head. Two weeks after losing Bonus in such a tragic way, Jade attempted to take her own life as well. I went out to go and hug my mum while she was hanging the washing. I just told her that I loved her. Her survival has spurred Jade on to expose the difficulties gang Fano face in getting the specialist help they urgently need. Because we're just losing too many Fano and especially our Māori people, our own people, you know. What if someone went through exactly what I went through, but they don't have family that don't have that sort of support? What's going to happen to them? Coming up, the high rates of suicide amongst gang members in our prisons. From our perspective, one death is one death too many. And we meet the people at the grassroots working with their communities in suicide prevention. I think it's the deep grief that brings us together and it's working.
Auraki mai anō. It's not only in the community where rangatahi gang members struggle with mental health challenges. Statistics show that things worsen for them once they're incarcerated, with those serving prison sentences at a higher risk of suicide than the general public. In part two of Bonus Atkins' story, reporter Rawani Pereira heads to Te Tairawhiti to look at some of the initiatives helping to combat the devastating rates of suicide, both inside and outside of our jails. The very first time I met him was at the beach. It just looked like there was just this dark cloud around him. Jade Tare was in a two-year relationship with patched mongrel mob member Bonus Atkins. Bonus committed suicide in August last year, aged 24. It wasn't the first time he'd tried, Bonus's first attempt came after his brother took his own life in jail in 2015. He loved this brother, you know. The state he was in before he died, he was in that exact same state. This dark. The number of inmates taking their own lives in our prisons is about 10 times the suicide rate for the community. In the last five years, 38 people have taken their lives while in prison. Almost half of those suicides were people who belonged to a gang. An uh, all too common story. It's tragic wherever that happens, especially with young people, and often far no uh, often at a loss as to what contributed to that, and let alone how to have intervened earlier. Clinical psychologist Dr. Amin Tamatea has worked as an advisor for Arapotama, Department of Corrections. Do you think incarceration makes mental health already underlying conditions worse? I think the short answer would have to be yes, uh, not least because prisons aren't designed for care. Security and containment are a strong part of what prisons are about, as opposed to growth and wellness. But that is set to change. This is Arapotama's radical new prison build, Hikitia, a 100-bed, dedicated mental health and addiction facility set to open next year. I think it connects well to Hokairangi and the vision that we will be more humanising and healing. What do you say to critics who might say this is a really soft approach in terms of incarceration and treating prisoners? I really strongly believe that this will have a more profound impact on the things that we're hoping as a department to achieve, which is, you know, safer communities and reduced reoffending, in addition to improving outcomes for Māori. What we've perhaps tried in the past hasn't always been successful, so the time is right to do something innovative and new. Corrections Director of Mental Health and Addictions, Emma Gardner, says it's the first year of a prison sentence and time in remand where self-harm and suicide are more likely to occur. 90% of people in Arapotama have either in the past or right now had a mental health or addiction problem in the last 12 months. 62% of them will have had a mental health or addiction challenge. So it's a very, very significant and important need for the people who we support. Tuta Narimu was a former member of the mongrel mob for 30 years and has also campaigned for the welfare of Fano in jail. I don't think there's much change over the years because the old Fano is still killing themselves in there. This is him in 1987 protesting on the steps of Parliament after a three-month hunger strike as an inmate at Paremoremo prison, arguing for better treatment of inmates. What I wanted was 24-hour access for our comatos into the jail, you know, when they, when, when they felt like they needed somebody to talk to. I have heard there's a lot more trauma in there. You know, that's tragic. That's a tragedy. Transforming outcomes for Fano is what Tuta's Nati for Life Trust in Tairawhiti is about, working with his community in the area of suicide prevention. This is where you can get the support if you need it. These days, his mahi centres around the role methamphetamine plays in the poor mental health of Fano, working alongside those who have also developed strategies to curb the high rates of suicide and self-harm. 
we're seeing a lot more whānau now that are dying by suicide that have had some kind of meth issue. And a lot of them have, you know, not just dabbling, but five years or more in addictions. And you can understand that world because they kind of like um, lose everybody in that world until it ends up just them sitting in that room by themselves. That would be the only downfall for us at the moment, is definitely the funding side of things yeah. and or just even getting someone to listen. With little resource, Tuta says they've come up with their own solutions for their people. We've got to really depend on whānau-led, papu-led initiatives because they're whānau that have that lived experience. You know, and the other good thing about that too is it's, it's got tikanga Māori alongside that and also what underpins all of that, there's kaumātua and Pakeki support there. For Jade Tare, it's the strong whānau support that she's received that's kept her clean and off drugs. It's been over a year now and I'm in a way better place than what I was a year ago. She wants to raise awareness of the struggles gang rangatahi like bonus face accessing the mental health support they so desperately need. That's kind of why I'm speaking out on it for everybody that's struggling. And despite still mourning the man she loved, Jade is hopeful for her future. It's gonna be okay. I didn't think better days would come, but they really do. Now, Rawani Pereira Tera Pūrongo, and it was made with the support of the Mental Health Foundation. Akwane ka kore ruau ki a debi ngari wapeka kaiarihi takirua o te Pāti Māori. Hoki mai anō. New statistics released at the end of October by the coroner's office show Aotearoa's suicide rate has dropped for a third consecutive year. However, Māori continue to be disproportionately affected. Deputy Chief Coroner Anna Tutton released the figures to June 30 this year, which reveal 538 people died by suspected suicide, down from 607 in 2021 and 628 in 2020. However, the provisional rate for Māori is 15.9 per 100,000, and that's compared to 10.2 for the general population. To discuss this, I'm joined by Party Māori co-leader, Debi Ngāri Wapaka, tēnā koe. Um, yeah, are you disappointed that those, uh, those results for Māori are still not... You know they're disproportionate. I'm I'm disappointed because it, it shows that we've got a um, a long way to go in the fact that you know we're continuously using the same structure, the criminal justice system, as a substitute for mental health, and it, it can't be. Um, and I think if we were to discuss, you know, what are the issues that are happening for our rangatahi, and what are the issues that are happening within Waka Mōmiri, then um, we need to be able to first and foremost um, steer uh, the, the mental health system and its um, inequalities and its failings for our people. Yeah, so when, when, it, when we are having a drop um, in the general public but we aren't for Māori, what does that tell you about our approaches and the way that we're tackling um, suicide or mental health? Well, I think it, it, it's sort of saying to us that the mental health system still believes that it's... Um, it's superior, it's got the superiority complex and it thinks it has all the answers to fix tangata whenua. So we can throw huge amount of resourcing, superior resourcing at it, but um, it can't achieve real change. Like we see our whānau order providers, our Māori providers, our Māori healers, our rungoa, our kaumātua, our whānau, um, because they're still using Western ideas. And I think that's the pushback that we have to see. It's the only reason why our people are, um, are being let down in the system. 
And I think that's I, that's the mummy that I feel for our Fano is that we have to watch the system land everyone else right, but our own people because it's refusing to bring through our own models. What would Te Pāti Māori do? What would you do, uh, Te Pāti Māori, to you know to you know to capture a greater group of Māori to bring them in on you know a high order journey? What would you, yeah. what would be a policy? Oh, easy. Look, I think the first thing is that we'd look to the wisdom of our Mātauranga Māori for solutions. We would be focused more on that for our healing. We would be addressing the fact that um, you know we have. Uh, I guess we, you know, the fact that mental health in Aotearoa um, can't access our people and our people can't access it because it doesn't recognise it and it's a cocktail for disaster. So we would focus more on being able to talk and engage immediately our whanau, our kaumatua, um, and stop stop treating, again, um, our whanau in, in a manner that... And, and if I can just elaborate, you know, we need to stop treating rangatahi um, in gangs as the problem instead of the symptom of the wider failings. Mm. And I think that's where we would, we would go. We would be brave to address the wider issues and not just scratch around um, the surface. Most important thing, we wouldn't be so arrogant to think that um, the existing system just needs a rejig and can make it happen. It needs a continuous overhaul that recognises uh, Mataranga Māori. When we... Uh you know, reflecting on those two stories that you saw earlier on in, in, in the program, um, you know, so th there's a huge need for support inside of prisons where we have, uh, I mean, I think the number was about 38 over the last five years um, while inside prison. So how do we get to th those whānau, that whānau? I, I think, and we've seen this, in fact, we saw this in the public health response, um, in COVID, I mean, therein lies some really perfect modelling. As long as we keep talking about rangatahi and gangs without ever talking to our whanau, as long as we keep talking about Māori without Māori, we're only going to further entrench trauma um, in our whanau and our communities. The models are being done. The, the, the reality is, is that we actually need to reconnect with our whanau, our hapu groupings, our iwi groupings, rural, urban, um, you know, and I, I guess that that's the um, that's really the the war cry. I guess is let, let's let's just go out and do what we saw happening in COVID. Let's let our communities be resourced to total war. Mm. And I think there was a quarter that said, you know, we need to be able to have our komatoa and our boys inside our Fano, our wahine and, and Raman to be able to access that total core. So, there, that you know, the, the, this government is building uh, what they call hikitia. Uh, mm. I think it's 100 beds for mental health and addiction in Waikiria. Is that the kind of kaupapa that you'd support? Oh, look, I, um, you know, the reality is, is that as long as our people are um, caught in, in systems like that, we're only, only going to be able to address part of the issue. The reality is, is it's much wider. It's not about just focusing on how we capture our people when they're inside the system. It's about having total or wrapped around the whole whānau, inside, outside, and more importantly, um, being able to have a total or that they recognise and can relate with. Mm -hmm. um, now, I understand that you were lucky enough to be in the Party of Māori Club and perform the poi at the Rugby World Cup. How was that? Oh, it was fabulous. I mean, it's a it's a lifelong dream. Um, most of our whānau know that. Um, it, it's I wasn't um, born naturally with a right and a left arm, so my wrists are, uh, you know. Uh, but so it was. It's been um, fabulous being up there with a lot of our OGs, of our aunties who were part of the original. It was fabulous vibes, you know, to be. Yeah, you know, we can relate to this party. A lot of people didn't think that. Um, we could come back no different to our wahine in that team and it was just the best experience ever, the vibes and, um, yeah, it's just dreams come true. It was just really awesome. The game was awesome, the whole thing, you know. What do you I think... Like um, that that what, your your what, poi might not know you, but you're, you, you you may not know your poi, but your poi knows you. <laughs> do you think that, um, you know, what has that win done for wahine um, in that sport now? Yeah, good good question. I think most importantly, it has shown a couple of things. Is that first of all, um, never underestimate our wahine and um, give them the total call that they deserve and our wahine coming through. Most importantly, though, this was also a campaign driven of Matauranga Māori, of Wāpui, of Kopapa that showed, in fact, uh, we belong as um, tangata whenua in Kopapa like this. Kia ora. And 
credit to those wahine. Tēnā so koe. Tēnā mm. koe. Ko Dave Ngāri wa peka tērā. Um, we leave you tonight with something uplifting. The new waiata by the Tuari brothers, e tama. Ko hiki na te hui e huama. Te puna whakatongarewa te hui i tautoko.